from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. We know we are now back from the summer holidays and we are ready to dig in with the important work that we do. Um, Judith Cannon had to come by the office. I was off last week to make sure I had not forgotten where I was and what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> And she happened to see me looking at the flyer, so at least she knew I remembered there was a program this morning. Um, this is another in the series that Library Services sponsors, uh, Elsie's Digital Future and You, that's coordinated by Judith Cannon uh, of the Cohen Division, and Angela Kinney of Alloway, who is on leave this week. Um, I'm Beecher Wiggins, Director for Acquisitions and Bibliographic Access for the one person who may not know who I am. And um, I'm going to kick off this morning's session. Uh, the title of Bit Frame on the Move is trying to capture the ever evolving um, development of the Library of Congress's initiative and foray into linked data, um, its Bit Frame initiative. Uh, we want to give you a sense of what has happened, where we are, and what we are expecting to occur over the next few months and particularly into um, fiscal 2017. So I'm going to give you, um, and our participants um, today, I should uh, run those down, and we'll just follow in order. And we think saving questions until the end is better. But if you have burning questions as each one of us finishes and you raise your hand, we will stop and answer those questions um, for you. Um, so in addition to me, we'll have Kirk Hess from the Network Development and Mark Standis office and Paul Frank from Cohen who will play off each other and give you a sense of the BibFrame editor, how that worked, which is one of the centerpieces in terms of the tools used to um, work with BibFrame. Then we have Sally McCallum, who's chief of the network and development at Mark Standard's office, who will tell us about the plans for the next phase of our operation. And I'll give you a very brief background of where we are and uh, then move into Kirk and Paul's taking over. About this time last year, I guess it was, um, I had determined that we needed to do a pilot, no, I guess it was a little bit um, beyond a year ago, do a pilot uh, to test what we have been talking about, we the Library of Congress, in terms of bib frame. And I was adamant that we move forward whether we were quite ready or not. And we were, in some respects, not quite ready, but we rose to the occasion. So uh, by late 2014, early 2015, we were moving forward because we wanted to test the efficacy of BibFrame, how we could use it, and what components of it we could test going forward. And in particular, the ability of our staff to be able to deal with that. Um, to that end, then, we identify some 40 to 45 staff members, uh, both within the acquisition and bibliographic access area and in the special formats areas to help us carry it out. And we had a mix of catalogers, technicians, and we covered all uh, format types, languages and scripts, uh, monographs, serials, cartographic materials, music, notated, sound recordings, uh, two-dimensional artwork, um, bringing in our colleagues from prints and photographs. Um, we wanted the staff to process whatever materials they normally process, whatever across their desk, and we wanted them to do it um, using the BibFrame editor. But in addition, because the Library of Congress must continue to distribute its catalog and data in MARC format, 
they also had to catalog those same items using uh, the MARC format. So obviously that was going to cut into their um, time and their production. So production was never a focus of the pilot. We termed, I did when I talked to the classes that were being instructed in preparation and the coin division did the training, uh, that these folk were pioneers. One, because we had some development work that we were still doing and we wanted input and feedback from them. And frankly, because they were doing something that was new and we weren't quite sure uh, what we were going to get out of that. Uh, to be prepared, they attended some 16 hours of training, uh, instructions that um, was being offered by COIN. And the pilot preparation on the technical side then uh, was done by Network Development and Mark Standards Office, and that included um, being able to create a BIP frame-like environment, and that called on transforming the existing mark records, some 18 million were targeted into uh, BIP frame descriptions so that the participants would have that um, environment to search against as if they were in a production mode for BIP frame. Um, the outcome was commendable. Um, Net Dev uh, actually converted some 13.5 million records into work and instance um, records so that this, the uh, staff who were participating would be able to do their searching and to get a feel for what that would uh, be like. Um, Sally may go into more detail about that and how that might change for the upcoming pilot. The BibFrame Editor was developed as the primary tool for the staff to use, and we'll get uh, more information on that. The staff used the authorities as they were in lc.gov and um, had that as a basis for the authority work created and how that was going to interact with the work that they um, would perform. Um, some the last number I got was like 2,000 bib um, frame descriptions that were created. I'm sure that's more like 3,000 now because one of the things that we did and what I haven't said so far is the pilot ran from uh, October 1, 2015 through March 31st, 2016. And during that period, some 2,000 descriptions were created. At the end of the pilot, so that staff would continue to um, retain the skills that they had developed, um, I determined that they should develop to vote one day per week to continuing to create uh, records in bit frame. Um, I also should note that the data that was created was done in the uh, bit frame 1.0 environment, and all those data that were created will be discarded because this was all in the test mode. Uh, we'll think differently about the upcoming pilot, and Sally may speak a bit more to that in terms of the stability of the data that will be created. Um, the next thing that happened, well, one of the things that happened during this period was the development of BibFrame 2.0, and that's going to be the platform and underpinning that will be used for the pilot going forward and will be the basis of a lot of the testing that will be going on, not just in the Library of Congress, but also as part of our external partners that Sally may also touch on a bit. Um, the one thing I should mention before uh, turning over to Kirk and Paul is that workflow didn't change. Because staff had to work in both environments, we just overlaid whatever staff were doing in their regular work. So we did not test the workflow and we have not done an analysis of how BibFrame will affect workflow. And the other piece we should say is that it also doesn't affect the acquisitions that, uh, side of it or the user um, access to the data that are created. All of those will be components that we'll have to worry about as we move forward. So as you can see, there is a lot to be done. I think we've made great strides uh, in terms of what we wanted the pilot to do to show that we could do this, that we could develop a tool that staff could use, that staff could actually adapt to. I think we did that. 
The next um, challenge for us is expanding this. Uh, do we use the same participants? Do we expand the number of participants? How do we get that training done? Uh, one of the things that I want is to make sure that we're developing a cadre of uh, experts that we can expand and build on so that as we roll this out, and ultimately we'll have to go beyond library services and beyond ABA in terms of what we want to do. So with that very high level uh, synopsis, um, now, well, are there any burning questions for me before I um, turn it over to Kirk and Paul? Seeing none, then I will ask Kirk and Paul to proceed as they have determined. Good, good morning, everybody. You know, I'm not as young as I look, uh, <laughs> but it's so funny when Beecher made that comment about you know the beginning of the fall season. I still feel like the day after Labor Day is the first day of school, so all those nerves and everything. So here we are on the first day of school. But but I'm Paul. This is Kirk. I think you could think of us maybe as um, Abbott and Costello or um, <laughs> Sunny and Cher. Yeah. <laughs> but the the point is, you know, pick your duo. Um, we, we worked very closely as a duo, and it was very interesting because um, we were facing in different directions, but we had to meet in the middle. So my, my focus was on catalogers, right? Reaching out to catalogers. Kirk's was on finding that interim between cataloging and technology and facing out towards the technology uh, environment. So it was a, a very um, productive, duo and I want to talk a little bit about that and because of that I thought it would be good or it was suggested and I agreed that it would be a good approach to have us both stand up here and just go back and forth and talk about our roles in, in the bib frame pilot from um, last year and into this year. Hopefully we can both be heard with the microphone in the middle. We didn't think about the microphone, we're playing the duo. <laughs> <laughs> One microphone, okay. All right, so um, th this, this dynamic duo didn't come into place right away, right? So in 2014, we were given a bib frame editor to work with, to play around with, to experiment with. We hadn't even thought about a pilot at LC. This is just, here's, here's, a, here's a product, let's test it out. It was really very interesting. Um, I'm just using screenshots. You can look down the left-hand side and you see the different formats, records, print, bibliography, books, dissertations, painting, very broad. On the right-hand side, you could see one of the input screens that you would use in the editor. Really no different from what we did in the pilot, but think about this. You see no code, no cataloging code represented here. Um, I make made the comment in the past that this would be perfect for someone who had, say, a very large collection of sound recordings, personal collection, and they wanted to describe them, right? Describe your own personal library. This would be a perfect way to do it. If you had LPs, you could put the album name, you could put the artist, you could put the description, subject, everything that you would need to use for your own library. And beyond that, this, this could also work very well in a public library environment. A public library could make great use of something like this. But think about the Library of Congress and the work that we do and compare it against what we have here. So one other screenshot that I wanted to show you was, and I use quotes here, authority work. This is how authority work would have been done in, the, in this prototype system. It's certainly very user friendly. If you're creating a new authority record, you put first name, last name. I love that. You know, we don't, we're not dealing with surnames or ele entry elements, all these things that catalogers deal with. You simply enter in the name. But the funny part to me was the birth date, death date. Now, the comment I made about, you know, I'm not, I'm not as young as I look. You know, when you have to go online, you're making a profile in some site and you have to put your date of birth. Well, you don't usually just enter in your date of birth. They give you a drop-down calendar, right? And you go all the way back. And I'm old enough to think, I wonder if my year is even on this list that drops down, right? Well, it usually is. But what would you do if you were born in, in the second century? If you're setting up an authority record for someone who lived in the second century, you're going to have to do a lot of clicking to get to that calendar. And then by that point, what difference does it make that the person was born on a Tuesday or a Wednesday at that point? Yeah, I mean, it just, it, it, 
I'm making fun of this, but, but I don't want to underplay that it certainly had a use. It could not maybe be used at the Library of Congress for the type of work that, that we do. On the other side of the screen, you see a, a new topic. I mean, think LCSH if you're a cataloger. If you wanted to propose a, a new LCSH heading, you know there's a very elaborate way to do that, and certain rules have to be followed, and followed instructions have to be consulted. So um, the, the, um, the, the editor that we had in 2014 was a start. But by 2015, we knew that we were going to have a pilot at the Library of Congress. Beecher already gave you a very good overview of what we did. Our cataloging code standard is Resource Description and Access, RDA. So we had to take this editor and turn it into something that catalogers could, could describe resources using RDA with. And so that's where the team Got, came together, this duo, and I'm going to let Kirk now talk about all the things that needed to be done to modify what, we, what you see here into what we used in the pilot. So uh, the profile editor, so when you, a few slides ago you saw there was a list on the side of formats, things like book or electronic book, those kind of things. So what are those? Those are profiles. So what's a profile? Well, it's basically just a template of fields that are grouped together. In the original prototype, it was hard-coded in there. There was no way to change it no way to add a new one other than by coding it by hand in, in JSON, which would be very difficult for people who don't know anything about JSON or even what that stands for. So we uh, contracted out to develop this tool called the Profile Editor, and this is what Paul and I used to develop some of the profiles. The first one we worked on was Monograph because that's always the bulk of work in technical services. So you can see here that there's a name, there's some elements, um, you can see at the bottom there's preferred title for the work and you notice it has these RDA terms. So one of the things we decided to do is uh, use RDA description and that's something Paul's going to talk out about later. Um, but basically the idea there is basically so you know the rules and then you can just enter it in the field for the rules rather than trying to remember an archaic number like Mark, the way that Mark works. Um, so another kind of challenge we had um, was there are many lists of things as well as lookups for things. So an example of a lookup is a name. We talked about that before. You know, you, you want to find uh, Tim Carlton is the example that Paul always uses. So which Tim Carlton? Well, you know, the one with this date and born in this date. So you can, you can look that up in id.lsc.gov, our linked data service. Um, but we want to make sure it's actually enabled within the tool and so one of the things that was enabled within this system is that at the bottom of the screen you can barely see there's something that says values, there's a URI there which is a lookup service. Um, so zooming in, so that's actually the um, URL you can go to in your browser and it goes to the linked data service and you can enter in a keyword or a name and it would look up and then you can see names there. Well it works the same way in the editor and that's how it was keyed in. Um, one of the things that Paul wanted to, me to mention was that when we originally did this, all of the lookups, while we could add them to the profiles, they were hard coded into the editor by the previous instance of this. So if Paul came up with a new list, he had to tell me about it. I had to go in the code. I had to write more code to add that list. In, in addition to, we had to actually load it into id.lc.gov. So eventually we realized that there's many lists that are already in L ID, but we couldn't use them because they had to do this whole process. So I figured one of the things I added was the ability that any generic list could, that's in ID could be accessed through the tool. Um, so that was another little challenge we had. It, it ends up that there's certain things that are a little bit different depending on the results. So um, in this case, you're searching for a name. Those had to be a little bit more specific. But if you're just looking up a code, um, what's another one, like format, format is one thing that we had, a mode of issuance, those things were just, you could put in there, so, uh, let's see, so I think Paul's going to talk about now our pilot. Right, so, so while, all, while Kirk was doing all this work with the editor that you saw, or hopefully saw on the slides, um, we were gearing up for this pilot. Beecher said 40 to 45 catalogers, LC catalogers, all RDA catalogers at the beginning, and then we added on some catalogers who use um, DCRMG a little bit later to test another code in BibFrame. But in order to 
have the pilot, we wanted to at least give participants some background in what's going on in this linked data semantic web world that they're participating in. They didn't need to have exhaustive understanding of this, but we thought it would be very helpful for them to, to have a basic understanding of, of what their descriptions were going to do once they got out there, you know, got out to the web or out to another, um, another area of access. So we started with um, a, a module one, which we called Introduction to Semantic Web and Linked Data. Um, when you have the slides, you'll be able to hyperlink from the header here and go right to this BibFrame training page. I encourage everyone to go to it. It's available externally as well as internally. There's some very helpful information there. Just if you want to have a passing understanding, if you want to increase your knowledge that you have now of what's going on, um, this is a great place to start. Module two talked about the BibFrame tools that we would be using, particularly the, um, the editor, the controlled vocabularies that we access through the linked data service, things like that. And then the third module was in the actual use of the BibFrame editor. So the next slide shows you where we started and where we were when the pilot actually began last June, June of 2015. So the, this slide on the, the image on the left shows that an initial uh, screenshot that I showed you earlier on. We've gone now to a much more robust profile. Six, all of the profiles that we were using in the pilot listed here, all uh, set up according to RDA instructions. So that, that's the important part here. Now, we, now we've introduced a code into a cataloging code into the BibFrame editor. So when you look at the BibFrame editor, you will see rather than simply formats listed and generic labels for information that you want to input, RDA vocabulary explicitly presented. So RDA work, RDA expression on the, um, in, the, in the editor itself, the instructions in RDA were hyperlinked. So if you're working in a, with a MARC record, Okay, let, let me step back. You're doing MARC cataloging in RDA. What do you do? Well, you look at the MARC tag. What does this tag mean? Um, you might need to go to the MARC authority format, MARC bibliographic format to figure that out. Then you have to make a, a leap to how does that MARC, MARC element map to RDA. You're doing a lot of thinking here and a lot of work. In the, in the bib frame editor, you click on the link, you go right into the RDA toolkit. You can read the instruction. So we've eliminated that intermediate thinking step that Mark brought into the picture. Didn't do it intentionally, it was just a matter of fact. That's the way Mark was when, when we used uh, RDA in Mark. So um, I highlighted here RDA work, RDA expression, subject of the work, creator of the work, to give you an idea of the of the RDA ness of the of the of the editor and the profiles here, um, I will say one of the biggest challenges in the pilot was reconciling the differences in vocabularies between BibFrame and RDA. Whereas the BibFrame vocabulary does not have the concept of an expression, RDA certainly does, and we had to to map in the best way possible that we could come up with uh, a way to to reconcile that that apparent uh, difference in, in vocabulary. And the, the guiding principle was that catalogers in the pilot should not have to do anything differently when applying RDA as a code, right? We could not introduce any roadblocks there. They had to be able to do their work in RDA except do it in the bib frame editor. So um, one of the uh, facts that we kept stressing to participants, even though we asked them to take some semantic web training and linked data training, was that once they input a description using the editor, they did not really need to be too concerned about what came out the other end, you know, the Kirk side of the, the duo. Um, through some interesting turns of events, it turned out that we actually did look at, in, in the pilot, the participants, uh, we all looked at the output. But I wanted Kirk to talk a little bit about that because it's certainly something that he knows much more about than I do. This is an example of a record of a resource that was described in BibFrame. Okay, so just I'll, I'll breeze over this a little bit. Basically, there's an ID at the top of one of these little groups. Um, it, well, all of them say underscore colon B node and a weird number. 
thing. Um, th those are just saying that as part of a, a document, you could have an externally available URL, URI, we call it, um, that you can access. Well, in this case, it's not accessible externally. It's actually within the document, but we still want to keep it as like a group. So these are all subjects, topics in this case, because that's the type. We used a bit frame. And then you'll also notice here that if you could actually see this very well, it's, it doesn't have RDA stuff in here now. Now we just have bit frame. So the, the actual like encoding format is separate from the cataloging process. So you, you use the instructions from RDA and you get bit frame. Um, we have two examples here. The ones that are larger are ones that where we actually could, as I kind of mentioned before, with looking up names, we well, can also look up subjects. So a subject was looked up, it's in ID, it has a URL, URI, so that URI is the authority. And then we also have just, it's not human readable, really. I mean, it's just a number. So we also have some access points, which is something that BitFrame 1.0 used, as well as a label. Um, but access points are kind of a, a construct for an older system where you didn't actually have a unique identifiable number for something. So you kind of had to identify it by a series of words. So now we're kind of moving away from that because we already have something that's unique, which is the URI. And then all you need is a human readable label. And that's something that's consistent with how other linked data systems work. Um, the second example we ran into is where Using the rules for LCSH, you can construct a heading that may not be actually be authorized, essentially. Is that right? So, um, so at the bottom, these ones that are short just have an authorized access point. That's basically where the cataloger just typed it in. They, they looked it up, they typed it in with all the little double dashes and everything that's in there. It's not really validated. Um, those all sh really should have URIs attached to each one of those parts. But in the pilot, we never actually figured out that particular method. So that's one of the things we're going to be working on as our next pilot. So that's that. Okay, so more lesson, that's one lesson learned. Yeah, so, um, more, yeah, so, so um, now I want to talk about those very same topics from the cataloging point of view that maybe more of you in the room might be able to relate to. So, so this is where the duo had some, we had some um, disagreements here, you know, it wasn't always rosy. Um, <laughs> so um, we had certain constraints in the, in the pilot, and one of them Beecher mentioned that we were asking catalogers to do duplicative work, right? You would do your description in the Voyager ILS, then you would do it in BibFrame. Towards the end of the pilot, we, re we reversed that order. You could start in BibFrame and then go to the ILS. But catalogers needed to do um, their work two times, but I think it worked out well, and I think we learned a lot from that. But what catalogers do and what technology people think catalogers do are totally different. <laughs> so um, a cataloger, or actually let's not be biased against technology people, just the average user, the public user. So let's say you go to Google, you're looking for something, right? You're going to put in generally a keyword search. Something's going to come up. You're going to get a results. You, you go through. You find, refine your search maybe, or maybe you find exactly what you want in that first screen. That's what a user does, and I think that's what technology people think catalogers do. But catalogers are actually looking for something that they want to be sure is, that, that exists. They want to, we're, we're searching to find duplicates, right? So we have to have a much more targeted search. Keyword searching is great, but for cataloging purposes, that left anchored search is even more important because we're looking for the known, not for the unknown. So for example, I wanted to use a, a resource that is about to be, actually has been published just this year. It's called Linked Data for Cultural Heritage. I show the MARC record. In fact, Sally McCallum was involved with this. She has a chapter in this resource. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I'm looking forward to doing that. But, but I want to just talk about what we did with the names and the subjects here. So, so we have editors, Ed Jones and Michelle Sakel. And then we have a really nice array of LCSH subjects assigned for the work. So let's, let's take the... The, the Ed Jones, I'll give Tim Carlton a break because I'm always using Tim, so I thought I should get somebody else. Um, let's talk about Ed Jones and let's talk about 
that second, well, the first two subjects, linked data, but more importantly, the second one, linked data case studies with the form subdivision, and talk about what BibFrame does with those, with those, um, those things. So, so here's the person lookup that we would use in, in the BibFrame editor. Kirk already told you this is searching against the name authority file as it resides as linked data in id.lsc.gov. So a cataloger, at first, when we were starting the pilot, this was totally relevance ranked keyword searching. That's not gonna help a cataloger who wants to see how many Ed Joneses there are and if the one he wants or she wants is already represented. So now, meeting of the minds, we now have a left anchored search in id.lsc.gov. You search in Jones Ed and you get a great array of possibilities here. Now, one of the advantages of doing your work in the Voyager ILS first is that you would already have decided which one of these Ed Joneses you needed because right now, in the um, editor, you are not able to retrieve the actual authority record to analyze it. You can only see the one XX, the, the heading. And you know, again, technology people, well, why is that so important? You just want the identifier, that's all that matters. And certainly that's true. In the linked data world, it's, it's all about identifiers, but catalogers still rely on that text string, right? So, so we have to be able to see that. So um, it, it searches very well in ID, and it turns out that the Ed Jones we want is the one who was born in 1951. We could click on that. But you might have noticed that there's a second box that says record authorized access point if added to LCNAF but does not appear in ID.loc.gov. Well, why would that happen? Because the over, there's an overnight distribution of authority data from our Voyager NACO node, the Voyager um, name authority file, into id.lsc.gov. If you were cataloging that resource today, the Ed Jones that you needed had not been established, you would have to establish it in Voyager using our, our, our cataloging client, but the record would not distribute to id.lsc.gov till the next day. So we had to have a way that catalogers could input the, the label, the authorized access point that they were creating to hold it in, in the BibFrame um, database. Um, now let's talk a little bit about subjects, again, from a cataloging point of view and not so much from a, um, a linked data perspective, although it certainly has an impact on linked data. That second one that I um, highlighted here at the top is linked data with case studies. Now, if we searched subjects, again, looking up against id.loc.gov, we key in linked data, we get a match. It's right there, linked data. There's nothing in the LCNAF until somebody holds a conference, a linked data conference, right? So, so we're happy with what we see because we want a topic. We, we want a, a topical heading for this resource. But you don't see case studies there. So what's going on? Why isn't it there? For many years, LCSH has worked on a very pragmatic principle of free, using free-floating subdivisions. So certain topics fit into categories, and under those categories, there can be certain subdivisions that are appropriate to those categories. So you can pick, pick an appropriate subdivision from the list that's appropriate to the heading, and you don't need to create an authority record. This was not always the case with LCSH. At one time, there was an, an actual authority string created for every LCSH heading. Well, it's always dangerous to say every, but much more regularly. With the free-floating practice, fewer authorized heading subdivision combinations were being created, but it was, it was an expedient decision because it, it, it increased the time of, um, allevi of, of working through production. I mean, you, things went faster when you didn't have to set up the authorized access point for every heading subdivision combination. In fact, although we saw linked data as an authorized heading in LCSH, there is also a subdivision record for case studies. Those subdivisions have their own authority records as well. But what we had to do in the pilot was ask catalogers when applying a heading subdivision combination that conformed to free floating practice to explicitly put in the heading subdivision combination with the double dashes, the traditional LCSH shorthand. And then that 
in the bib frame backend would convert to what you saw in an earlier so slide that, that Kirk talked about. But now I'm going to per put Kirk on the spot because what I never was quite sure about was what happens to this string in bib frame. So does the ID up here represent that string? So yes, the ID would represent that string, basically. Um, but you, you kind of see a little bit of a problem because back when I was trying to explain this before, it's a blink node. And so it's not necessarily something that's easy to find or reuse. So one of the challenges we have is like in this case, is this something we're gonna, you know, we wanna be able to find again somehow. We might have to save it. We might have to change this from a blank node to a different construction where it's like a uh, something local to our system, but not necessarily something that you wanna say everyone should use. It's just something that we're using internally because someone thought it was a good idea. Because otherwise you're gonna have to do this. You know, you're doing it one time is one thing, but what if you do it a hundred times? You know, whether there's a hundred case studies you have to catalog, well, that would be kind of annoying. So you'd want to do this stuff. And that's one of the things we've been thinking about in our systems is how to, you know, make things a little bit easier by looking things up or choosing from lists or having defaults, those kind of things. And so um, something long-term, definitely um, the seed could be planted in phase two, but something that we might want to look at in the long-term is um, maybe a way to know that one LCSH heading has a certain authorized list of appropriate subdivisions. So I'm not saying that we would um, have to create an authority record. Maybe we will eventually. But wouldn't it be great if you could call up that heading and see, oh, which, which subdivision is appropriate? Have a list come up where you could pick from that list, right? So ways that we could sort of um, use linked data, use the BibFrame editor to um, improve on the way we can describe resources using LCSH when it comes to a heading subdivision. This is a long-term thing, and it's, a, it's one of those paradigm shifts in the way we approach. Now, free-floating subdivisions have been around for a long time, and now I'm saying, that, well, well, maybe in the future we might need to think of another way, and future could be years, years ahead. But, but the, the bib frame pilot, phase one, brought this to our attention that, hey, maybe there's something we can do to um, make this process a little bit easier for catalogers. So um, Kirk talked a little bit about um, the, in a way that was some, still a little bit hard for me to understand, about how he would create these explicit lists of control terms in id.lsc.gov so the bib frame editor would look them up. Here's some examples here. But um, I, I wanted to ask Kirk to talk a little bit now about the value. You know, as we look more towards linked data sources, external vocabularies, internal vocabularies, what value is there? Is there an increasing value in linking to an internal vocabulary where you download an external one internally so you have a little bit more control over it? Or is the value more in linking outside so we don't have to duplicate the work? And I just wanted to see what Kirk thought about that from a technology standpoint. I don't think it was one of these three, but um, one, one little issue that we kind of run into is trust. If you, if in the linked data, you can essentially link to other institutions' data themselves, and so you don't necessarily have to keep it internally. So RDA is one example. I mean, these lists that we have are all on RDA's linked data service, and we could theoretically use them. Uh, one little issue is that they're not exactly consumable, at least in the past. They weren't really consumable the, the way that we were doing it in our system. So they're, they're a little technologically behind. It was, it was still usable, but it was just a little bit off, um, mostly because they didn't really have a searching, they don't have an index, it's just, they just have the documents. So it's all, you'd always have to cache them, it'd be somewhat inefficient. Um, a second reason we kind of wanted internally is because we could use our own infrastructure to do it, and then we don't have to worry about what happens over there. There actually was an example where Paul told me about a list, I implemented it, it didn't work because it didn't work. It was actually, the, the RDA list had some errors, and we actually had to correct it ourselves. Um, and I had to tell them about it. So, you know, we, we all make mistakes. We're all new at this. So, so that's one of the reasons that we've actually been, like, importing data into the ID.LSC system, because that way we're in control of it. We can, you know, make sure it works. If someone says something's wrong, we can, we have control over it. We can fix it. But in the future, I think we are going to have, you know, some things are going to be external. We're going to allow people in profiles to say, you know what, there's this other term that's useful to my particular format that I'm working on. It's not an ID, but it's, it's, a, it's from someone we trust, and we'll go ahead and use it. So 
and that's one of the things that'll happen. The same thing with our, our records. I mean, the, one of the promises is that we'll work on something, we'll have a description for a resource of some kind, and then it'll be there, and then people can just link to it. They don't need to actually do you know, copy cataloging, essentially. You know, you have to go through and copy every single piece of information or make sure it's valid. I mean, you can simply say, you know what? It has this number, and it's this URI, it's that. And that's, that's what we're looking for. So we're hopefully get there, but we're still early. It's a little new at this, and everything is up in the air. The technology is, in some ways, it's, it changes so fast that we can't keep up with it. Other times, it's like we're inventing it at the same time that we're doing it. Um, sometimes we find out we're a little bit behind, and we get told by other people in the community that we need to step up our game and stop doing something that we thought was some other group had told us that was exactly the right way to do it. So, you know, <laughs> we're all these different directions. So that's, I think we've been doing a lot better. We have all these uh, relationships with other universities that are working on the link data for production project, which really is trying to uh, kind of work on these things where, you know, we have things we actually work on to make our systems provide resources for users. So we need to actually make it work. And how do we make it work? Well, we need to make production systems. And how do we make production systems? Well, we have some examples of things we need to do and we implement those. So that's something we're working on the next two years. Um, and I think that's going to give us a lot more, push us a lot further, a lot closer to really using linked data for everything. Okay, so this is a, we're going to share, the, this is more, of a, more or less an introduction to Sally's part of the presentation, but we want to talk about ours um, view of the next steps based on phase one. We want to continue to analyze the data that Beecher mentioned. All the, all the uh, descriptions are out there. We can still look at them. They're in vocabulary one, but still they're useful. We want to address the community review of BibFrame vocabulary 2.0, which is relatively new, hasn't been out that long. Explore other controlled vocabularies. Um, do you want to read any of these or should I just read them off? Go for it. Okay, take lessons learned from phase <laughs> one into account as we work on the profiles. You know, this is, the, this is our wish list for how can the editor be improved for, for the next phase. Um, refine some of the mark mappings that we had and capitalize on the positive achievements. Then there were a lot of positive achievements. There were, there were some rough, rough bumps along the road too in phase one, but we're capitalizing on the positive achievements from phase one as we look towards phase two. So now Sally McCallum will talk about um, the visionary future of, of what needs to be in place before we can even contemplate starting the next phase of the BibFrame pilot. Thank you, and that was an excellent introduction. Uh, this is sort of the eight-step program, eight-step project to get to the next pilot. And it is a, a huge undertaking. And the first one, the first thing, the first thing we had to do was work on uh, the model. How did we want to change the model? How did we want to change the vocabulary for the next pilot? And that's 2.0, in other words, BibFrame 2.0. We had had a lot of input on 1.0 since 2014. We'd had community-wide input. Uh, on GitHub, we had something like 200 um, comments that came in, and we reviewed all those on the listserv. We had more than 200 comments, and somebody sort of distilled all those and to see if there was a, a whole lot of, of listserv comments can maybe yield one uh, really pithy comment, but still it, it, was, it, was, it was important to pick out what we could, we could use. We had some expert advice. We had a consultant or two do some work for us and, and uh, review some think, parts of what we were doing. We had the pilot experience. And uh, the uh, things that uh, the additions that were made to those profiles during the first pilot, those what the, those additions said is those are missing in the vocabulary 1.0. Uh, we had a uh, program for cooperative cataloging comments. We had the LD for P comments, and those are that's the uh, uh, cooperative project between uh, among rather. Uh, Stanford, Harvard, Cornell, Princeton, <coughs> Columbia, and the Library of Congress. Uh, they are funded uh, participants, and we're an unfunded participant, but they wanted us in their pilot, in, in their uh, program. Uh, and they gave us a lot of comments, and they're still giving us comments. 
we had um, the audiovisual media study that we had, uh, we commissioned for, uh, from uh, some audiovisual specialists who worked with the people at Culpeper on, on it, and um, it gave us a new view of a, a important area that we have incorporated into 2.0. And then we had proposal papers for key areas, for titles, for agents and roles, for, and, and there, there were a number of these. And we put them out and left, left them out for comment, put them out on the uh, listserv, I'm sorry, put them out on the uh, website, <laughs> announced them on the listserv, and then uh, got comments on them for about three or four months. So the initial model 1.0 was simple and innovative, we thought. It, was, uh, it had works, uh, the key, key areas, works, instances, and annotations for your holdings, for your cover art, for things like that. It was a very interesting idea. And uh, if you could see this screen, I don't, I'm not sure you can, you can see that off the works you have agents and um, uh, something else, creators, creators and um, subjects. And off of instances you have things like the publication and, and the typical things that are related to instances of works. So our 2.0 model is uh, fundamentally the same, but we had a couple of, of adjustments that make the, the picture look a little different. We clarified events, and events can be um, content, so they can be, uh, the works can have content of event. They can also have subject of event, and those are two different, really different concepts to the audiovisual people. And so we, we tried to incorporate that into the model. Uh, we have, we added items as a core class rather than calling it, using annotations as a substitute for item. Now the vocabulary. We had a good introduction to the fact that uh, the, what, the vocab what we call the vocabulary in BibFrame is. It's uh, similar to the marked uh, fields and subfields. Uh, marked vocabulary is 260. Input screen said probably 260. BibFrame vocabulary are single words and phrases such as provision activity, which is the same thing as the 260. And, but on the input screen, you can do anything you want, and that is what uh, uh, Kirk and uh, Paul tried to make clear that we have more control over what we actually uh, use with respect to the cataloging environment and the input environment and we, and we are using that control to make it a better environment uh, than we had before. Not that you didn't all learn what a 260 and 245 and a 350 and a 300 and so on were. Um, in, voc in the vocabulary, we also have rules uh, we had to decide on, and one, the first one was we decided to continue to use the resource description framework, RDF, for the, um, for the vocabulary. Uh, it, MARC itself is, um, uh, while you have a lot of tags, which is like the vocabulary, you also have an underlying uh, uh, set of rules for how you express that, and that's called ISO 2709. It's a, it's a standard that just gives the uh, platform for how you do, how you express that vocabulary. Uh, and we decided we would go ahead with the W3C's resource description framework because it is uh, sort of the, the basis for linked data and it's supported by the World Wide Web Consortia rather than just by library groups. Uh, uh, you can see there are some examples of, of conventions we adopted which uh, may may or may not mean very much, but the, the distinction between data type and object type is very important in RDA and RDF. Um, we, you had to be able to do your label, the, the text version of something. You also wanted to have, be able to have the URI at the same time, and we had to make it so that you, that could happen. And, and various other things that are very, um, uh, that are, aspects or characteristics of RDF we had to make choices on. So the holdings annotation became the item core class. Uh, authorities in, in the new vocabulary became agents and concepts. We don't use the word authority so much because we use agents, which are the persons, organizations, meetings, and jurisdictions, and we use concepts, which are topics, places, times, events, and works. Uh, and then we have a better accommodation of standardized vocabulary, we think, and free, 
free text vocabulary and real world objects. The, um, the community went very um, crazy about the distinction between real world object and the label of a real world object a couple of years ago. And, and it's, a, it's a valid distinction whether, and it can be used for various things. It's not tremendously useful, but it, is, it can be used to make uh, certain kinds of inferences about things. And so we uh, made it a better distinction between those two. And most of all, we have a better accommodation of RDA. <coughs> the vocabulary 1.0 was a mixture of MARC and RDA, MARC, uh, AACR and RDA, whereas the new vocabulary is much more, it's uh, 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 planned or it's organized within the RDA organization, at, at, like the RDA organization, and it, it uses a lot of RDA. We did finish that in April. We published the model and the vocabulary, and it is the foundation of everything we do in the pilot. So these things, these steps come one after another, and they are dependent on uh, the uh, earlier steps. The second one is the second step is the uh, uh, mark to bib frame conversion, which is a very difficult task. Uh, the uh, we, we did make a commitment in the pi first pilot, and we have one in the second pilot, we hope to do it better, uh, to bring forward all of the MARC data so that catalogers, when they are trying to create a record in BibFrame, can look at the whole body of, of, of the catalog in BibFrame and then decide whether they, what they want to do. And because that's the way catalogers have been working and how they should work. Uh, they, there, but there are vast differences from MARC. Uh, and we have to, first of all, we had to identify patterns in the MARC data, but we have to deal with the things in MARC because MARC grew over, over years, over 40 years, and uh, uh, one community wanted this, another community wanted that. They were similar, but they claimed they were different, so we did both of them. The things like that have, have elaborated MARC. Uh, there's a variety of approaches. Sometimes you have statements, sometimes you have codes, sometimes you have controlled terms, sometimes you have text, you have all sorts of things in MARC. Uh, you have uh, uh, the extent of MARC, which uh, even though we were trying to follow RDA and RDA's, the RDA model to some extent, we have acquisitions and subjects and shelving and location. We have a whole lot and preservation information in MARC that's not in RDA, so it's not going to, RDA is not going to tell us anything about how to structure the vocabulary or what we need in the vocabulary for those areas. Um, we have a, a duplication of data, uh, and that, that's the thing, one of the things that's proliferated over time is the, uh, we have codes, and this, we have the same thing in text form, we have the same thing maybe in uh, controlled vocabulary form. We, we do that a lot in MARC. We did it increase. We did it from the very beginning, let me say. But we did it increasingly as time went on. Um, and we have local data. We have a lot of important local data that we local data in Mark that we have to we have to record. We have to be able to show it to catalogers so that they can uh, understand what they're looking at from a uh, technical from a, a cataloging point of view. Uh, we have to identify. We have to have the identification of the URIs where possible. So while we may bring a code forward, we want to look up that code in ID then, and get a URI for it, and substitute that URI for that code. And as you know, we have a lot of coded data in MARC. Even uh, controlled terms, we want to take the controlled term, we want to look it up in ID, we want to have a, we want to have a URI instead of that term in our, our RDF descriptions. We call them descriptions in our, when we talk about RDF rather than records. Uh, then there are the various RDF techniques we have to figure out that how we, there, there are several ways you can usually do something in RDF. We have to decide, okay, we're going to do it this way and we're going to do it consistently this way rather than doing it this way for this data and that way for that data and that way for another kind of data. So we want, we're trying to keep ourselves keep it, things consistent, and we want to eventually make it shareable. The conversion specs are almost finished, and we have a uh, consultant, we've employed a consultant who uh, knows a lot about MARC uh, and, a, and a lot about linked data who's going to do the, write the actual programs for the conversion. Uh, step three, MARC to bib frame conversion program. We, that we, create, we need to create the conversions in the test programs. 
we need to create a conversion service for the community for experimentation if possible. And that actually, it, that sort of, it seems like a little extra that we don't, shouldn't have to do, but it is very useful. And we found it very useful with the 1.0 vocabulary because the, the people in the community got right on it, converted records, that took these, this converter and converted records and started giving us feedback. And that, that is more than, you know, we can get even from our own catalogers. We got it from across the country. So it's very, very important. And we want to share those programs. They, we always do share, and we always try to share. Uh, step four, preparation of the files. We have to take the, and this, this is a big, this is a huge project, part of the project. We have to take the uh, MARC title authorities, and they become BibFrame Works work descriptions. We have to take the MARC bib records with uniform titles, match them with these work records, and merge them into the work description. So we have these match and merge, match and merge. We have take the MARC records with uh, uniform titles but no authority record, which there are many of those, and we have to create a, a work. So we have to distinguish between those that have uniform titles and no authority and those that have uniform titles and, and do have an authority so that we can create a, uh, a bib frame um, work record. We have to take marked bib records that are without uniform titles and there we can cre we create a, a bib frame work description. Then we have to merge the subjects uh, from the bib frame, uh, from the mark records into the bib frame work descriptions and consolidate the subjects. If there's more than one <coughs> mark record that goes to one, to one bib frame work record, we have to take the subjects from both of them, merge those in some way, and, and put them together, and put them on the work record. Uh, and then the mark bibs, finally, what's left, we have to go, after we've taken all the work information off, we have to split the instances. And that is very difficult because of the way we've done that in mark over time, in that we, we tried to sort of push in different instance types into one record because it helped with our systems. It, we, our systems worked, worked that way. <laughs> so so we, um, uh, we, do we want to try to split those off then in the, in the new environment, which is, again, that's RDA and that's our, the way RDA would like for it to see us uh, structure and model bibliographic data uh, for, they think, a better user experience. And while we're doing this, we, have to, we want to keep pointers uh, among the new work and instance records and descriptions so that nothing, the, these things don't fragment. Step five, we've got to prepare the, have had to prepare the in infrastructure, and that's been ongoing since, um, oh, last year, actually. Uh, we use the, uh, th and this is the hardcore uh, 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 platform. This is um, what uh, uh, Nate Trail in our office is the person who, who uh, handles this the, the most, in, uh, most. That's his focus, let's say. Uh, the uh, LC uses the MarkLogic platform. Uh, we've had a major move of the platform internally to virtual servers. Now we were, have, have accomplished those, that, that uh, with difficulty, but with uh, very good assistance from OCIO, with, from the new reorganized OCIO. We've had uh, major version upgrade of the platform with the addition of a new semantic module. We have done that, we've got that in, in place, but we have not got all of the data loaded to it because we need to have lossless movement then of the, all the data that we have in the old version, in the old link data service, into the new link data service without interruption. And this is not, I mean, while the pilot uses ID, uh, the link data service, the community uses it a lot. If there are peak times when there are several million hits a day on that service and other times when it's, it's more like two or three hundred thousand, but it's always very intensely used. People have gotten, they, they, it's been, uh, the link data service has been in operation for one vocabulary, then two and three, four, five, for the last uh, six years, because it came up in, 19, in 2010. And, and so uh, a lot of uh, people, a lot of systems people out there have started using it to in update their, their systems, to, to get information, to get current information from us. So we, we and when we, it goes down, they let us know. Uh, so we need to, uh, we have to do that without interruption. 
and then we have to uh, plan and load the new, the, the revised, the reconverted uh, bib frame files in this new semantic environment, and we had a different kind of semantic environment before. Um, step six, we have to uh, uh, revise the bib frame editor and the bib frame profile editor, and you've heard a lot about that this morning, uh, more than what I would, <laughs> would be ready to say. Uh, review and revise the editor functionality, and um, uh, revise the interface labels. Uh, I think they told you, uh, uh, Paul, I think, told you about how the, the labels were designed for the interface, and you, he has, I'm sure, ideas on how he wants to redesign or revise those labels uh, based on what he, his interactions with catalogers in the pilot. Um, we, we have a lot to do, and we have to make this available to the community. We have to rebuild the links between the editor and the, the actual vocabulary. Uh, step seven, review and augment the linked data service. Is, it's an integral part of the pilot, so we want it, the editor, it provides the editor with its drop downs, with its look ahead information, with all sorts of things. And, and uh, while I talked earlier about the outwards use of it, it's also a very heavy inward use of it for, for uh, the bib frame and for this, the pilots. Uh, it, it provides the URIs for the data during our preparation stage when we're preparing the files. Uh, we need to redesign this application, move it to MarkLogic, and augment it. And the fi finally, the step eight, a very big one and was excellently done in the, for the first pilot, and that's the work that COIN does for re, re, um, uh, preparing the materials to, to, to training material, holding retraining sessions, holding new training sessions. Uh, they were, had an excellent, did an excellent job of setting up feedback mechanisms so that, and giving catalogers constant support so that I think it was every week or every couple of weeks they had a, a session that you can come if, you, if, if, if you're having trouble, come. If you don't have trouble, you can just continue to work that day. Uh, so they, they did a lot of work to prepare the documentation and to hold the training and to hold the uh, hands of the people uh, during the pilot. Uh, so part of it, we're starting a work wish list for the new pilot. I think that um, uh, a few, uh, Kurt and uh, Paul made a few comments on that. We would like to have daily conversion of the bib frame, uh, to bib frame and load of the new bib descriptions. Uh, with um, the first pilot, we could not have daily load of bib records. We had daily load of authority records that were coming into the ILS and then coming into bib frame, but not bib records. The, there, it is a, a, a major undertaking, a major challenge to be able to do that because you've got to do this merge and match when you, when you bring any one record in, in, into this uh, uh, set of records that's already there. Uh, and we uh, would like to have an input editor for names and for subjects so that people could have an experience of what it's like to try to do their names and their subjects, authorities, essentially. I use that word, but I'm not supposed to. But at any rate, the, the, those, those descriptions in the, um, right in the environment that they're, they're doing their bib record in. Uh, so take away from, for this, from this uh, what I've said, Keystone is the vocabulary. If, the cop if a, we're having some trouble with that, but if the vocabulary keeps changing, then we have to keep changing all these things all the way up, including the documentation for the training. Um, and all other tasks are dependent on its, therefore, <coughs> on its stability. But we see the pilots as essential for understanding what we're going into for the migration of Mark to a new platform which uh, we've done a lot of work trying to, uh, to make that as good as possible because we have uh, 50, 100 years of cataloging information that we can't lose and we must be able to bring it forward. Uh, and it also we see this as part of understanding how we make libraries a part of the linked data environment. So thank you. Is the intention to be able to save the records this time 
so that it can be used as opposed to them going into the ether, like they did with the first pilot, and not be able to review them and see them? We all need to stand up there. Yeah. Well, someone who is, who is going to answer. <coughs> I think a better thing to think of, actually, is that the editor was just an input screen initially. It wasn't supposed to do anything. So this would, and so is that useful for production? Well, no, because you need to do things like you're mentioning. So then what do you need for that? Well, you need a bunch of things behind the scenes to make it all work. And so that's what Sally was talking about. As part of getting all this stuff behind the scenes working, we're going to have whatever the editor is called in 2.0. I'm leaning toward renaming it something completely because it's going to be really a part of a, a prototype ILS-like system rather than just a <coughs> simply an editor where you can just type things in fields. So it'll have saving and um, we're really hopeful we'll have a lot more features, not just for entering descriptions. Um, like Paul said, we, we've always had this hope that you can do a lot more things like authority work. And so that's another thing I think we'd want to do. So you could actually go into an ID record for a name and actually open it up and maybe make a change to it and save it back an ID into our system. That's one thing I think we'd also like to do because I think that's, and then that would somehow flow into the Voyager system somehow. I mean, that would be like a, in the years in the future, we might actually do that, but that's one of the ideas. Virginia? I'm supposed to come up here because we're being filmed. Regina? <laughs> I'm going to stay on something. Given that RDA can be output as RDF, um, given that um, Deborah Fritz and company have developed RIMP, um, and a demo editor for outputting RDA as uh, RDF, or they say as a big frame. What, why, why isn't, or is LC investigating going in those directions as opposed to working on its own to sort of parallel some of these efforts? <laughs> Well, I, I think as several of us have said, we are collaborating and working with various constituents in the community. And we are and have been working with uh, Deborah uh, Fritz and company. And I'm on the RDA board. And the RDA board has, I think it's, it's fair to say, adopted uh, RIMF as one of the um, paths it wants to take. I know Paul and Judith in particular have worked with Deborah at several of the ALA um, meetings to see how these come together. And it was also part of what we discussed at the OPCO meeting in May. Um, Paul or Judith, do you have further elaboration on that, or either Sally or uh, Kirk, beyond the fact that we are taking those into account? Um, I, I think it's a, a good question. It's a valid question. Uh, but from my perspective, we're still so new at this that there needs to be a lot of experimentation still among different constituents before we all come together and agree on something. We have used Deborah's product, the, the RIMP, and we had, a, I, I think, a very productive demonstration of how that could be used to display um, visualize RDA, and then we use the bib frame editor. That's the type of experimentation that I still think needs to take place before we actually, you know, buckle down and say this is the way we're going to go. So. One of the things that I think LD4P is really focusing on is partnering with each other and working with each other and strengths and weaknesses. Um, the RIMF editor is, as far as I know, is a visualbasic.net, which is not very popular in the library community. It's closed source. It's not open source. You hear about open source. It's the opposite, where it's not accessible by anyone. Certainly, you can use it. Like, they have a license where you can actually use the tool, but you can't make any changes to it, as far as I know. And so it becomes kind of difficult while it's a great, I mean, it's been great for the community, and people, people like it, but how can I integrate it in our MarkLogic system? Well, it's not possible, because it's in Visual Basic, and it's not one of the options. So certainly, we could port it to something else. 
but that would be a really large effort to do that. And, you know, essentially that's what we're doing. So I, I'm kind of disappointed that that's one of the cases with that particular tool is that it seems like we don't really have them, you know, we don't have that in our, in our development community where, as far as I know, none of the LD4P partners are thinking about RIM for, you know, porting it or working with them at all. So that makes it difficult. Um, as far as the vocabulary, I know one thing that's come up before, and I think conversations, Sally might hopefully will agree with me, is that people consider RDA's version of RDFs too complicated. It's like it's, they, it, there's obviously a need for complicated vocabularies because the world is complex, and so you need to have things. But the same time is, if you look on Google, I mean, what happens in the screen? Well, you know, you get a list of gobbledygook. I mean, it's just a bunch of words. And certainly, it seems behind the scenes, it does all sorts of great things with your keyword searches. But there's really, it's actually relatively simple, like the amount of stuff they have. <clears throat> and, and the one that they, the yeah, ontology they really prefer is, is schema.org, which is a lot flatter than BibFrame. It doesn't have a lot of classes, but it has lots of properties. And even those properties, there's a lot of possibilities, but I think we were investigating some of the um, implementations of that for library materials, and it was like it was like eight or ten properties. So it's pretty simple. If you look at something like um, you know Dublin Core is used by DPLA and Europeana, they have about 20, 21 properties. I think I was telling Sally about that the other day. So they've they've dealt with the complexity by making it less complex, but it, but because of that, it doesn't accept the range of descriptions that a lot of times um, different library communities want because they really do want to be able to describe things in a lot of detail. Um, and it could be difficult to do that if you only have 21 property options, of which about five or six, I think, are just for this system. So, you know, that's one of the things I think is a challenge is that is, is Google going to adopt RDA? I don't think they even understand it or know about it. <laughs> and so, and, and I know that's something I worry about with BibFrame because BibFrame is still complex, but I think at least our goal is to, we want to be able to hook into these other things that are maybe not as complex, but we have some, uh, you know, we're thinking about same as relationships where you can say that it's the same as. So if you're searching in one of those ontologies, you at least could get some BibFrame and maybe as they get more BibFrame, it becomes more useful and they see it's there. And if we have a big volume of it, it's going to be useful to Google and they're going to use some of it. So that's one of the goals. So it's, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, not everything works in technology. So people <laughs> succeed. Maybe RDA is, is better than what, I mean, we're all doing experimentation. We're not quite there, but that's one of the things I think about. So Thank good you. question. That's very helpful. Aaron. <laughs> Currently with OCSA, you can distinguish between, let's say, baseball in Australia with cricket in the United States, you know, the minority sport. Keyword searching, with, if you don't have the link between the subfield Z and the, sub, and the subfield A, you will not be able to distinguish that record from baseball in the United States with cricket in Australia. But there are obviously two different sorts of words. The examples you showed for subjects don't seem to have the ability to break down fields, eliminate subfields. Is there a commitment to preserve the pre-coordination capacities in LCSH? I know with RDA, you seem to be wanting to make sure BibFrame accommodates RDA. Is there a similar commitment to preserve LCSH in BibFrame? Well, def definitely during phase one, and most likely phase two, as I said, catalogers, had to do everything that they do now in MARC in BibFrame. And the Library of Congress has made a commitment to continue to pre-coordinate string, LCSH string. So that's why we were doing that. The point I was trying to make is that what happens when that, that pre-coordinated string is not matched by something that can retrieve it again sometime. So yes, we definitely are continuing LCSH as, as we're instructed to do now in BibFrame. And I know that's, that will continue into the next pilot. Peter? Yeah, um, I have a question about, I got confused of, is the editor going to become an, a new ILS, or is there going to be, is it going to be funneled into a next generation ILS, because I know that Voyager's no longer being supported. That's not true. Oh, it's not? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still, I'm still trying to figure out what's going to Next generation of 
Well, I'm, I'm probably the last person who should answer that question, but, but I will say, uh, confirm what Anne said, Voyager is supported. And right now, we're not looking at BibFrame as a database of entry. I mean, that's coming down the road. Maybe you all could, could add some comments to that. No, I think that's not one that we will answer. Anne answered it succinctly. She has responsibility for that, and she will be keeping all of us apprised of her foray into a replacement system for Voyager. But now Voyager is Voyager, and BibFrame we will overlay on the system that we have. Questions in the back, since I've been starting at the front. Any remaining questions? If not, uh, I know Judith has a statement she wants to make. Um, Sally, is there anything else you need to say? And my other colleagues. OK. Judith? I just want you all to know um, that I have Beach's permission to put on a series of um, sessions, probably in the dining rooms. I've got to find out when I can get the dining rooms. And they will be an opportunity for people that were not in the pilot to um, have a closer look at the editor. It won't be hands-on. Um, I'll be calling on um, Les and Hien and Tim and Manon um, to provide this training. But I am curious, how many of you would be interested in taking a closer look at the editor and what people that are in the pilot are seeing and doing? Because I know today it was very difficult for you to see the screens, but there wasn't much we could do because it was being filmed and they need the lights. So is it, what's the level of interest? Oh, good. Well, I'll start with a couple of sessions. If I need more, um, I'll put on more. They'll probably last a couple of hours, but it will give you an opportunity to have a really good look at the editor and see how it's filled in um, by those that are working in the, on the pilot. And when we finish phase two, I'll do the same for you so that you can all keep current. Right. Yes. Could you be sure to include Culpepper in that? Okie dokie, we'll do that. <laughs> yes, you, sorry. You can tell by her face she'll have to figure out how she's going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Karen. I have a question for um, um, uh, Kirk and Paul. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, Kirk, can you talk about the You just told me I had to repeat the question. I, I know the answer, but I'm trying to think of what the question was. So that basically, <laughs> <laughs> that you have to um, you have to basically think about you know obviously we're doing things in, in Mark or Voyager, and then we're porting it over to ID, and there's a delay because it takes a day or something. Whereas we could just simply enter it in ID and be there, and then it would go to Voyager, and it probably could also be a little bit more seamless. So yeah, I mean I think that's definitely one of the things we want to do because you know especially with names, I think that's one of the things we really could accomplished but you know it takes some more effort because it's kind of uh, again I might be overstepping my balance but I feel like it's kind of stepping from experimental to production when we're you know I don't want to get yelled at about getting stepping into Voyager's domain but basically that's what would happen is we'd have to really push it into their their court as something else and that's another thing they'd have to work on and maybe they're not staffed for that right now so you know but we've got to I think it's one of the things we have to think about as part of this pilot is that once we experiment with names uh, maybe we can, in one of our you know test databases, we can actually enter things immediately and then figure out how to generate um, you know mark basically at the same time. That point is maybe we can change our processes so it's a little bit more efficient. Um, and I think we can do more with our linked data service than we can with the mark authority. So maybe there's some actually enhancements we can put in there um, to make it a little bit easier to use. So there's a lot of there's a lot of promise there. That's one of the things I hope we. We get a lot of good information when we work on that in our next pilot. I just had 
Did you, Paul, did you want to come? Well, I, I can't resist the opportunity. Okay, so when Aaron asked his question, question I had to say that you know we're making catalog, we're, we're saying that catalogers should not have to do anything differently. So um, I'm just going to say something. Think of a future possibly where maybe you don't use just the name authority file from LC. Maybe you link to another authority file at an, in another country, another something like that. That's what linked data is all about. So that's where we're thinking ahead, where we might have, we, we, there might be possibilities to change the way we do things now. So I just had to put that out there. Mira? I just to, Mira? Yeah, I just wanted to know when you, are, you anticipate the next phase to begin. Yes, that's what I was going to wrap up with. I, I was amazed no one had raised that yet. Um, as you heard from me earlier in giving you the recap. I'm always pressing to go faster, faster, more and more. Um, my colleagues, and I think Sally laid out a very strong and clear uh, path to getting to the next pilot. I have wanted to start in the first quarter of the new fiscal year. I think based on what you've heard today, it's fair to say we will not have the next pilot begin before January 2017. I want uh, the technical side to have the time to do the things that they need to do so that the next pilot is not as um, rushed and frantic as the first one and that there is more confidence in the stability of both the vocabulary and the infrastructure that will support that. So as of today, I think it's fair to say that we're aiming for the second quarter of fiscal 2017, meaning not before January. Uh, in the interim, then, we'll be having these sessions as we are having similar to today and the ones that Judith just described in terms of giving those of you who are not necessarily involved in the pilot now a better sense of what the tool is like and what is involved in getting ready for the pilot. Um, do I have any objections from my colleagues on the front row? <laughs> All right. Uh, they set the stage for this at uh, ALA Annual when I had been saying the first quarter, and then by the time I got up to make a presentation, I had to say, well, I'm being pushed back, and I think this really does make sense in terms of the complexity of what we want to do and that this is really going to be a transformative initiative, not just for our area, but for the Library of Congress itself and the uh, community with which we are working. Uh, on that note, are there any final questions or points to be raised? We have about three minutes. If not, then we will close with that, and I thank you for your participation and my colleagues for the work they're doing to make this happen. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.